Father, thank you so much for this evening and for this time together. And we pray now that you would um, help us to concentrate, help us to listen hard, help us to be able to encourage each other as we hear from you in your word and as we think about what it is to reach out with the good news about Jesus to those around us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good, good evening, everybody. Good, great to be back here again. And so soon that you all remember my name. It hasn't been weeks or months, but then you might have forgotten it. I'm Adam Boyce, um, and I'm from London City Mission. As you might have heard on Sunday, um, or since if you listened to the, the podcast, the playback. There we go. Yeah, so I'm, I'm a missionary um, with the London City Mission. I'm based in Haringey. I'm the, the missionary team leader over there. Um, well, I have a team of one at the moment, but I am still the team leader. And I do, it's funny, <laughs> you laugh. For quite a long time, I had a team of, no, I was the team. And so I was the most effective, on time, um, productive team leader in the whole of London City Mission at one point because I was just looking after myself and I've got even better. I've got a lovely Romanian guy called Daniel in my team. One day you might, you might meet him, um, he's great. And so London City Mission, we, we exist um, basically to share the gospel and to equip people to share the gospel. And we estimate that there's currently a staggering one in three Londoners um, that are unlikely to hear the gospel in their lifetime. So that's approximately, if there's about eight to nine million people in London, that's approximately three million people that we estimate will never hear the gospel, the good news of Jesus. It's a big task, <laughs> massive task. And our, in terms of our history, um, we um, came into existence in 1835. It was founded by a Scottish guy, as I mentioned on Sunday, called David Naismith. He founded what was called the Young Men's Society for Religious Movement. No, Religious Improvement. Young, Man, Young Men's Society for Religious Improvement in 1824, which went on to become part of and known as the YMCA. Um, he founded the Glasgow City Mission, the Edinburgh City Mission, and this city mission movement just started to gather pace. Um, and then he felt a call to come to London and to, to start the London City Mission at a time in 1835 when there was mass movement coming into London um, from the suburbs and from the countryside. And his mission statement or his vision statement, as we might call it now, was to go to the people of London, especially the poor, to bring them to an acquaintance with Jesus Christ as saviour and to do them good by every means in their power. And he basically took working class men, uh, as you can see here in this picture, gave them some training, gave them a wage, gave them, a, gave them somewhere to live and placed them amongst the working class, class people, um, as he said, to bring them to an acquaintance with Jesus and to do them good by any, good by any means. And today, as our, our current CEO says, today London has changed, but the mission's vision to take the gospel to London to least reach the hardest reach people remains the same. And so this is really what we want to want to see. It's a big, one of those big wordy statements, but it, it means everything that it says. It's to see a growing and flourishing church in our city that is envisioned, equipped, and enabled to share the love of God and good news of Jesus Christ with the least reached communities in London. And what we mean by least reached, it sounds very um, catchphrasy, but what we basically mean is those people in London least likely to come into contact with a Christian, least likely to hear the gospel, least likely to go to church. I think you get where I'm going with, with that now. And we can't possibly do it all by ourselves. And so our, our sort of vision, our new vision and our new plan um, is to bring our gifts and experience and work alongside churches like yourselves and others um, to equip people to be more equipped, <laughs> to share the gospel um, with people in their lives and to raise up workers, raise up volunteers, raise up people um, to be able to go out and make disciples and fulfill the Great Commission. And Ephesians 4, so Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip people for the works of service so we very much see it as a mandate from the apostle paul um, for us to be equipping the saints um, for works of service that we're all called to do and so how do we do that 
um, three ways. Um, number one is the gospel, and that's making the most of every opportunity, and it's deliberately at the top. Making most of every, every opportunity to share the gospel, gospel clearly, patiently, and sensitively. Focusing on those communities where there's little or no Christian outreach, and doing it in partnership and by supporting the church, by training them, equipping them, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And why do we do that? Well, simply put, I mean, again, this is a stat, but this is a, 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 an eternal um, stat where 21,000 people heard the gospel for the first time from an LCM missionary in the last five years. And so, but 3 million people in London still are not hearing the gospel. So we've all got a lot of work to do. And I say we always, and we always, the body of Christ, have a lot of work to do. Hence why Tom is looking so worried. <laughs> And so who are the least reached? And this, this picture of pictures kind of just gives a snapshot of that. So that's the youth centre that I used to run in Dagenham um, with some of the young people. I'm not quite sure what Ariel's laughing at. And that's an estate in I don't know where, but you can imagine um, who might live on that estate. Um, I'll leave that to your imagination, knowledge and background. And here we have my friend Andrew. He's the team leader over in Kennington. Um, he's... I'm um, speaking to one of his contacts, um, who is a lady of another faith. And here is my um, brother Tyson, and that's our Weber Street daycare centre, where they work with homeless people. And he's talking to one of, the, one of his friends that he's been getting to know over a while. So there's a picture of who we call the least reached um, in London. And we've split our work into five areas of specialism. Um, we've all got our gifts and strengths. So we've got estates and seniors, um, says what it, it, it does what it says in the tins, homeless and marginalised, diaspora churches, and that's churches that are run by and attended by people that aren't from here, basically, and you've got where you've got movements of people from, say, Nigeria, Ghana, Cuba, and they've settled here and they're, they're worshipping together in, in a space. We would regard that as a diaspora church. Um, Islam and other religions and children, youth and schools. Um, and I kind of float in between these three here because my team is so big, <laughs> I have to cover quite a bit. Pray for more workers in my team. <laughs> I think I keep on pressing the wrong button. So um, just an, as an example of, of how we do that. So this is um, Kerry, um, and she was, um, there was a new chance that was planted in Islington, and the minister there moved his family onto the local estate. So they really wanted to get embedded in a local community but he didn't know where to start in reaching that community because he wasn't from around there um, and he just didn't know where to start. And so Kerry was a missionary at the time. She's now a team leader over in Tower Hamlet. So she's moved on from that area. Um, so she joined the church as a missionary and her job was not to do the evangelism. This was just in the early stages of us transitioning from our old way of doing things to our new way of doing things. Um, so she started there very much with the idea that she was going to equip the church to be able to reach out, to be able to knock on doors, get to know the community, put on events, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, very much with a view in mind that she's going to leave at some point and leave and leave them to it. And so she would take the church staff from from door to door, um, knocking on doors, getting to know the locals, as you can see here. Um, and they started to see some real good fruits, and the church plant has started to grow indigenously if I've said that right, it's late, um, from the people that live on their estate and, and from the local area. Um, this is, I, I mentioned it briefly on Sunday, this is um, a project that I've started called Eat the Word. And basically what we do is we um, cook with the young people and then we sit around the table and we eat and we eat the word of God together as well. Um, and I've kind of broken it down. Yeah, so that's another project that, that we're rolling out with churches that either the youth work is dying or is dead or they want to start some youth work and they've got no, no experience of, of doing that. I'm not going to tell you about Adam Boyce because you heard about it on a Sunday and if you missed it, play it back. I'm sure it's going to be riveting. Um, but I, I was ba well, I'm, I'm based in Tottenham. This is the Tiverton Estate. I did mention briefly that I used to help run a church plant and, and so this is where we used to run the church plant, plant from at the, at the hut. Um, we used to run some really good um, stuff there. I'm going to blame my finger why it's not moving. This is this is us on a Sunday. Um, ooh, ooh, ooh. And I'm finished. <laughs> <laughs> well, shall we pray? <laughs> I'm going to go back. Oh, spoilers. Oh. Yep, so we're going to do some Bible tonight. Um, 
could somebody up there help me out and just take it way back to there? Perfect. Um, so this is a project that I used to uh, run. It's called, was called Young at Heart. There was an old people's home not far from the hut and the church where we were from. And so we'd go in there with some young people and we would read with them. And especially at Christmas and Easter, we'd sing hymns at Easter and take in Easter eggs. And at Christmas, we would go in and with, with presents and do carols. And then we started to invite them into the hut and we would cook with the young people and put on a free course Christmas meal with them. And nobody died, it all went really well. Um, it was very tiring though, as you can see in the picture. I thought, I was still quite drunk. I had no mulled wine, honestly. Um, and it's another event that we put on, on the estate and it was uh, what we, I called Culturelicious, play on uh, Destiny's Child's song title there. Um, and it was basically inviting the locals and just next to the hut, it shares the ground the grounds with a primary school. So we'd invite in local people from the state and parents from the school and basically just bring a dish from your local culture, from your culture and bring it in and we shared and, and it was great. Um, great food, a um, lot of mess afterwards. Um, I did lots of work with boys and estates that always involved football, faith and food. And we wanted to get them together without them arguing. So we put together a Tottenham Cup where the estates would compete against each other and um, this was the final, and David Lammy, bless him, came along with his son. He supports Tottenham, so I didn't really speak to him on the night, on the day. Um, and Broadwater Farm Estate always used to win. I don't know if it was because everybody else was scared of the Broadwater Farm. They were really big lads, bless them. Um, and they never returned the cup um, after we finished it. <laughs> to be fair, we did finish the competition, so they didn't really have to return the cup. Um, and that's the youth center I used to run in Dagenham. There's some evangelism training that I was doing in Tottenham, a bit like with guys yourself, so you're not my first guinea pigs. And this is one of the, the link-ups that we run. You might call them camps, um, but was told off by the young people for calling them camps because we don't get in tents. So we had to find a, another name for them. And I think that is enough of talking about me and what I do. But basically, we do it because London needs Jesus. And have we all got Bibles? Brilliant. And so on Sunday, must look at the clock, right? Technically, I started at 20 past. You said I've got an hour. I'm going to go by that time. Tom, just give me a really serious, yeah, give me one of those looks. Um, if I see you walking towards me, I would know I'm really over time. So it, it, Sunday was all about being his witnesses. And that's not changing this evening. That's what it's going to be all about this evening. Um, so, no, there's a verse missing. Oh, that is strange. Very strange. Okay, anyway, going to Acts. Um, on Sunday, we was. I'm, I'm, the slide is probably hidden, which is probably why it's not showing up, unfortunately. But it was, an act, it was an Acts 1, 6 to 8, I think it was, or around about there. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it's not for you to know the times or dates. The Father is set by his own authority, but you will receive power with the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes on you, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And so to the ends of the earth. And as I said on Sunday, to the ends of the earth have come here to, to London. They're here in this room. We're all part of the ends of the earth and they live all around us. And so we've got an example in the Bible of somebody who shared their faith with somebody who was from, he would have considered the ends of the earth. So if we flip forward to Acts chapter eight, and it's gonna be on your screen for you as well. I'm gonna pray and then we will, crack on with that. Father God, thank you for this evening. And thank you that your spirit is here amongst us. Thank you that you are leading us, you are guiding us, you are stirring us. And may we look to you, the author and perfect of our faith. Um, I know we're tired, Lord, in our own ways. And Lord, thank you for stirring the hearts of everybody in here to come out, be it in person or be it on Zoom. Um, to meet with you and to meet with your people. May we be refreshed, um, encouraged um, to be more like your son and to share more news about your son. 
and may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing and acceptable to you, my Lord and my Redeemer. Amen. Um, does anybody know where Streatham is? Mm, one person. Anybody know where South London is? Clearly you guys don't go there very often. You know very well where South London is yet yeah, because you're South London like me. Um, so anyway, there's a place called Streatham in South London. It's where my daughters live. And there's a place called Streatham Hill, which is kind of coming out of Streatham. And there's a junction at, um, at the top of Streatham Hill with Christchurch Road, Brixton Hill and Streatham Place, which leads down to Clapham. And so anyway, I'm approaching this junction and the, the lane to take it to Christchurch Road is a restricted sort of right turning only lane. And I was in that lane and I thought, oh no, I better be over here. Otherwise I'm gonna end up going on Christchurch Road. It can ruin my evening because it was Valentine's Day an evening. And as a single Christian, as you do, I was getting together with some other single Christians and we were gonna have some pizza and some movies. Oh. <laughs> um, anyway, so, and I was running late, which isn't like me. Um, and so anyway, so I thought I must get over here. Anyway, so I've just sort of turned over. Obviously I've looked in my mirror, I've put my indicates on. I've gone over and there was a car coming behind me and I didn't hit him or anything. There was nothing, but it was a bit, it was close. Anyway, so I've gone over. And so that guy's sort of come in front, come beside me. Traffic lights have gone red and he's looked, I've looked, so I've sort of noticed what he's done. And he's looked at me and he said, why don't you window down? He's like, he's big guy, like made me look small, big, no hair, tattoos, t-shirt on it's february valentine's but he's only got a t-shirt he must be really strong if he hasn't got a coat on he was just as really big he's like when the window down i've looked like well, it wasn't that deep like I, I, i'm sorry anyway so i didn't wind the window down because he was like really serious and scary anyway so i've gone through the traffic lights got to the next traffic lights please don't change please don't change it's changed it's gone red gone through those traffic lights no i've stopped at the traffic lights he's pulled up again when the window down I don't know why he's doing that. Like I was driving like a more a nearly brand new car. Anyway, that was a bit silly of him. Thinking about it now. Anyway, so he's like, wind the window down. Um, I'm like, I've got a button. Um, anyway, so I've gone through those lights. Anyway, this has happened again and again. Got to the lights by McDonald's at the bottom of Brixton Hill. He's done it again. I'm like, I'm not opening this window. I basically got to the lights by um, Brixton Station, Brixton Tube Station, gone past Brixton Tube Station at the lights where you're gonna to turn to go to Stockwell and you've got a police station over on the right hand side. He's come beside me again, he's like, wind, wind the window down. I'm like, he's getting my nerves one, two, he still looks very scary, but three, the police station's over there. So if I wind the window down now, the if, he, if he tries to shoot me, the police are gonna come running out and, and, and I'll be safe, I'll be safe. Obviously they're not gonna know what's going on. But anyway, that was my stupid mentality at the time. And so I've sort of, I've pressed the button. I haven't done that. I pressed the button, the windows come down. I've looked at him and he said to me, mate, your lights are off. So the car I'm driving is a hired car. And during the day it had these sort of, it had the lights on automatically. So I just assumed I'm driving in the evening now that the lights are on, but the lights that came on were day lights that only come on during the light during the day, not in the night. And anyway, so I put the light, put the lights on. I said, <laughs> and I've drove and I've driven off really, really quickly because I felt like such an idiot. Um, but he was a very scary guy. Anyway, we're gonna um, look at a story now about another guy who came alongside another guy on a road, nothing to do with headlights. Um, let's get into Acts. Chapter eight, we're gonna start from verse 26. I mean, at one point I was thinking, do I owe this guy money? I grew up in South London, haven't been over there for years. Do I owe him money from a previous life? Does one of my cousins from their previous lives owe him money? Like, is, is this the day that the retribution is gonna happen? It was all because the Toyota Aris I was driving, the lights didn't come on in the evening. The lights were off and somebody was like, no, that, that didn't work. Anyway, an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south down the desert road that runs from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out and he met, I'm going to read this pretty far reading. So he started out and he met the treasurer of Ethiopia, a eunuch of the, Can, the Kandake, the queen of Ethiopia. The eunuch had gone to Jerusalem to worship and he was now returning, seated in his carriage and he was reading aloud from the book of the prophet Isaiah. The Holy Spirit said to Philip, go over and walk alongside the carriage. Philip ran over and heard the man reading from the prophet Isaiah, and Philip asked, 
do you understand what you're reading? And the man replied, how can I unless somebody instructs me? And he urged Philip to come up into the carriage and sit with him. The passage of scripture he had been reading was this. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. He was humiliated and received no justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me, was the prophet talking about himself or someone else? So beginning with the this, this same scripture, Philip told him the good news about Jesus. As they rode along, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, there's some water. Why can't I be baptized? He ordered the carriage to stop and they went down into the water and Philip baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch never saw him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Meanwhile, Philip found himself farther north of the town at the town of Azotus. He preached the good news there and in every town along the way until he came to Caesarea. This is the word of the Lord. So to the ends of the earth. So we first come across Philip in the Gospel of John. And please come, I didn't hide this slide as well. I'm hiding everything from you. Oh, no, there it is. Uh, yes, we first come across Philip in the Gospel of John, chapter 1 at verse 43. And he has this encounter with Jesus, um, where Jesus basically says to him to follow me. And how does Philip respond? He goes and finds his friend Nathaniel and tells him, we found him, the one that all the prophets and Moses wrote about, Jesus of Nazareth. And then check Nathaniel's response. Can anything good come out of Hampstead or Nazareth in their case? So Philip says, well, come and see. And I guess this is my first challenge to all of us here this evening. How often do we tell people to come and see Jesus? Be it at church, be it in our lives, how, how often are we that bold, like, like he was, to say, well, come and see for yourself about this Jesus. Philip was called out by Jesus. He was made a disciple. And the first thing he does, he goes and tells his friend that he's found Jesus, this one that everybody was speaking about. And then Nathaniel doubts him and doubts Jesus. And he tells him to come and see for himself. You know, we should be like Philip, bold in our faith, bold in knowing that Jesus is real, and bold in our love for his church and telling people about him. Sorry, I'm, I'm digressing slightly, but back to the eunuch. If we recall back in Acts chapter one, Jesus said, be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And as I said before, this one verse can sum up the whole of the book of Acts. Um, and as I said, I'm not gonna go through it again, um, how, how that spreads out across um, the, the book of Acts, but most of the believers, as, as we read, on Sunday were scattered throughout the country. They, they were fleeing Jerusalem. They were scared for their lives. Philip has spent a chunk of time in Samaria, an area, area of non-Jewish people. And then Philip gets a tap on the shoulder, he gets a nudge, he gets a WhatsApp message from God via an angel of the Lord to head south along a desert road that takes you to Gaza. And Philip doesn't ask why he's being sent to the middle of nowhere. He just gets up and he goes. And along the road, he meets this Ethiopian man who is a eunuch. And to keep it really high level in PG, a eunuch, if we don't know, is basically a man who cannot have children. Um, go and Google if you want a further explanation. This guy, he was, but he was an important and powerful man, though, because back in Ethiopia, he was like the queen of Ethiopia's money man. He was the, the, the sunuk to their... No, okay, that's not going to work. Um, but it, it's not by chance, though, that Philip met an Ethiopian eunuch on this road that God sent him down because God said via his prophet Isaiah, here we go, Isaiah 56, don't let foreigners who commit themselves to the Lord say, the Lord will never let me be a part of his people. And don't let the eunuch say, I'm a dried up tree with no children and no future. For this is what the Lord says, I will bless those eunuchs who keep my Sabbath days holy and who cho choose to do what pleases me and commit their lives to me. And so basically to keep this short, God already had his chosen people, you know, the Israelites, the Jewish people, but God's plan all along was and is for all people to be saved, including us, all of his family, and to be his people. And here we have a man who is a foreigner, is a stranger, and the Jewish people would have very much looked at him like he was a stranger. 
And this guy, he also couldn't have any children. So after him, his family name is going to be cut off. And, and that would have been really important to him. He would have considered himself as having no hope and no, no future. In other words, this eunuch represents an outsider. People that people consider to be not like them, not normal, not from round here. But God made a promise that anyone who commits to him will be saved. And we also see that this eunuch was a religious man who was a worshipper of God. He's on his way back from the temple in Jerusalem. And, and, but while he was there, because he was a Gentile, he would have been made to, to worship in the outer court. So it's like almost like on a Sunday, we're all in here and lovely and warm, but out there, there's some chairs and they're marked foreigners. And literally, if somebody comes into the church who isn't from around here, who doesn't look or smell or walk or talk or pray, you say, right, no, you're out there, please. Don't, you're not coming in here. And that's, that's literally how this unit would have been treated. It's unthinkable that we would even, unless they support Tottenham. <laughs> um, but he would have travelled miles and miles. I can't stop using that Tottenham joke. <laughs> oh, they're just horrible. Um, he would have travelled miles and miles to get there from Ethiopia. So he really would have made an, an effort to get there. And here he is, he's on his way back home, reading from the book of Isaiah. But despite all that religion, and despite him going to the temple, reading the scriptures, dedicating his time and energy to worshiping God, it was all pointless. I wonder if you picked up on, yet yeah, on why it meant nothing. It's because he doesn't know Jesus. And that's a really dangerous place to be. And I guess it's kind of a harsh reminder for us. You know, loads of scripture after scripture, we can go to church every week or even on a midweek. As well, we can tithe till the cows come home. Please don't stop tithing on my on my advice. Uh, Tom won't be happy with me. But if we don't, any anything we do, it means nothing because we're not saved. Just like this eunuch wasn't. And so Philip is given another nudge by the Holy Spirit. Is told to go over, walk alongside the carriage. So he does as the Spirit tells him to do. He walks alongside the carriage, and the power of asking the right question kicks in. He doesn't look into the carriage and say to the eunuch, great day for it, isn't it? Or what did you hear Boris said at Prime Minister's question? He doesn't say something silly like that. Hearing the man reading from Isaiah, Philip asks him, do you know what you're reading? How am I supposed to get it if nobody explains it to me, the eunuch responds. And do we see what's at play here already? The, the Holy Spirit's power is leading these two people. Philip wants to teach God's word and the scriptures, the Bible, and the eunuch wants to understand it. And both of them have their hearts already in the word of God and pointing towards the word of God. And we see the eunuch's honesty in his reply. And he could have acted like he knew what it said, to show face, to look intelligent, whatever. But he was honest because he wanted to learn about what he was reading and who he was reading about. And, and what's he reading? He's reading Isaiah 53, where we read a lamb, like, a lamb led like a sheep to be slaughtered. And the eunuch is really desperate to know who the prophet is talking about. And what does Philip say to him when he's asked? He doesn't back out. He doesn't say, did you see the match yesterday? Shocking result again with Arsenal. He doesn't change the subject, no. I mean, that would have depressed him if he did, because we got kicked out the FA Cup this week by Nottingham Forest. Um, he doesn't shy away from the matter. He just keeps it on. He's got that opportunity there. He's got this guy who's hungry to learn about Jesus, who's got the Bible open, or this big scroll it would have been, and he shares the good news with him. He tells the eunuch about Jesus. He uses that moment to tell this curious, unsaved Gentile just who Jesus is and what he did on the cross. And he sits with him, he opens up the scriptures, and he shows him Jesus. And, and what's the eunuch's response? He's compelled to obey. As they traveled along, they came to some water, and the eunuch gets excited and asks Philip, why can't I be baptized? And what's Philip's response? In the Anglican version, you really must speak to the elder in charge of baptisms who's here. I'm joking, I'm joking who's here on the second and last Sunday of the month. You really need to take six baptism lessons. No, and there's nothing wrong with all of that. I did baptism lessons myself when I first became a Christian. And actually, that was my first contact with a London City missionary who took, uh, who did my baptism lessons um, 15 years ago now. I don't remember them. They were good baptism lessons, but I, I don't remember them. Um, 
But Philip doesn't hinder him or delay him because this guy's on fire. He's just given his life to Jesus. He's just understood for the first time, his eyes have been opened, his heart has been set on fire to just who Jesus is, just who the prophet was talking about. The eunuch orders the carriage to be stopped. They get in the water, Philip baptizes him and the eunuch's response, and I really wish I knew his name so I wouldn't have to keep on calling him a eunuch. Um, but his response is, you know, the Holy Spirit moves Philip on to share the gospel elsewhere and the eunuch went on his way rejoicing, skipping, they wouldn't be skipping down the road because he was in a carriage, but metaphorically skipping. Brothers and sisters, this is mission in this little scene in Acts. This is everyday people led by the Holy Spirit coming alongside everyday people, not necessarily like themselves, and the power of God's word and sharing God's word, the spirit moving people to move people towards God. And it's all wrapped up in this one little example in this massive book of Acts, in this massive Bible. But for someone to accept the truth, he must first hear the truth. Now, I'm a slightly hypocritical saying that because nobody shared the gospel with me, but I'm an anomaly. Um, yeah, that's not often that that happens. Jesus told us to be witnesses wherever we go. And so are we going to leave here this evening as witnesses to Jesus is my question. Not for St. John's Church, lovely church, great people, but for Jesus, for God, for his kingdom. If that sounds really daunting, we're going to go through some stuff now that's hopefully going to unpack that a little bit more. Um, but going back to my moment of salvation, um, when I went on St. Anne's website and I read the Bible 15 years ago, Olu, who's a great, a lovely Nigerian brother of mine who no longer was at St. Anne's Church, that's a different story, he moved away. Um, he knew a thing or two about building websites. And so St. Anne's needed a website about 15 years ago. And so he built one for the church. And some think, I don't know what, I'd like to think the Holy Spirit told him, oh, let's, put, let's create a download section. This all sounds really corny, but it actually happened because he actually created a website that actually had a download section and actually had four PDFs, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. And little did he know that this heathen guy from South London was going to come along and read Mark and that would lead to him being here trying to teach you a thing or two this evening. Because Olu took some time to create a website for his church. What time and gift or whatever can you give to, um, your church, your worshiping community here to maybe bring some more heathens into the kingdom of God? I don't know what you're doing already. I just thought I'd throw that out there. Um, are you going to be open, you know, like Philip, to, to them, them Holy Spirit leading conversations? Um, I mean, you might not come across a eunuch on the London overground reading a scroll of Isaiah, baffled as to what it means, and there's a perfect opportunity. But God is going to put opportunities in front of you, and he probably already is. Like I explained on Sunday with the electricity um, set, call centre guy. But we worship a faithful God, and he's given us this incredible mission. And so let's try and get on with it, shall we? Okay, talk amongst yourselves for a couple of minutes. Um, this was planned. Um, what experiences do you have of sharing your faith with people that are not like you? What experiences have you had? There's no wrong or right answer. I had none whatsoever um, once upon a time, not too long ago. Talk amongst yourselves for a couple of minutes. So we're going to look at what is the gospel. But before then, because I put the slides in the wrong order, we're going to watch a video. And it's just an example of a really rubbish conversation you can have about sharing your faith. It's absolutely hilarious. I'm going to try my, my hardest not to cry, but it is so hilarious. But it reminds me, actually no, because this is this do my old boss and injustice, but it's the kind of scenario where with my old manager, he, we'd, when we'd have our catch-ups or one-to-ones, he'd it'd, 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 it'd open it up with, Adam, how are you? How are you doing? And I'd say, oh yeah, you know, I'm fine, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And the third, et cetera, oh yes, that's like back in the 80s when I was in this area doing this. And then the next hour and a half, he, he just got stories after stories after stories. And it's all wrapped up in the guise of, how are you, Adam? Tommy, you laugh, is that what you're like as a manager? Like, can anybody relate to that though? You know, when you speak to somebody and they ask you a question and then the conversation, the rest of the, yeah, right. So let's go. Oh, excuse me. Can you help me? Um, I've just come from a party. Um, I'm sorry, I'm just a park. Someone just came up and took off with my dog. Right, yes, hold on a minute, madam. Uh, George, there's a lady who says she's looking for uh, eternal salvation in the Lord. <laughs> I didn't 
say that. I said someone came up and took off with my dog. Right, scratch that, Joel. She's changed her mind. <laughs> no. It's a she. She is called Jess. Jess. Right, so that's J E S U S. No, she's called Jess, and you've just written Jesus. <laughs> so I have. Still, it's a lovely word, isn't it? <laughs> Jesus. Jesus. He died for all our sins, you know, madam. <laughs> oh, right, sorry, madam. So you say you were in the park when you lost uh, little Jesse. Right. Would that be the park by the church, madam? No, the one by the lake. Yeah, but you can see the church of our lady from there, though, can't you, madam? Can you? In that case, madam, would you have been able to hear the faithful singing from there, something like this? Come my arm <laughs> Have you been able to hear anything like that, madam? Um, I, I suppose so. Mm. And if you had heard it, how loudly would they have been singing? Would it have been sort of... Come by, come by, Or more sort of... Oh, Lord, come by, Hmm? All right. Well, um, look, if they had been singing from where I was, um, it would have been about as loud as... Um, now, madam, this fellow that took your dog, can you give us a description, please? Um, yes. He was quite tall mm -hmm. and had sort of um, long, straggly hair oh, and, and a sort of a beard. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds a little bit like Jesus, doesn't it? Look, are you two going to do anything to help me? Yes. yes. And don't say, yes, we're going to pray. <laughs> no, it's all right. Um, now, give this man... Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I've just been overwhelmed with the love of our Lord. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I don't wish to appear cynical, but somebody has stolen my dog, and I want to know if you're going to do anything about it. Uh, well, actually, ma'am, uh, there's something here. Apparently, we arrested someone earlier today who answers the description you just gave us. Oh, that's marvellous news! Yeah, and even better news, we forgave him and let him go. <laughs> Lord knows our hearts. We're not laughing at the gospel or Jesus or the dog that was missing or the fact that he let him go. But do we see what's wrong with that conversation? Um, yeah, not a good way to start having a conversation about the gospel. So what is the gospel? Uh, according to the dictionary, it's the teaching or revelation of Christ. It is the church's mission to preach the gospel. And so the big picture of the gospel um, there's many ways you can break down what the gospel is. I'm going to quickly whiz through these two, three, four, five points as to what the gospel is made up of. And it's made up, number one, it's cre creation. Genesis 1 to 2, there was nothing, God spoke, and there's the world. So God created the world. And then we've got the fall in Genesis 3, where God gave man everything he needed. It wasn't enough. God said to man, don't, and, and man did, and we're, we're all praying, paying, the, paying the price for it now. Oh, ooh, spoiler. Promise. Uh, Genesis 12, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse them and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So God promised that through Abraham, everybody would be blessed. And then there was redemption. John 19, 7, the Jewish leaders insisted we have a law and according to that law, he must die because he claimed to be the son of God. And that claim was true and he died and he made them look silly because God brought him back to life again and he rose from the dead. There's redemption through Jesus' blood on the cross. And then there's new creation, 1 Corinthians 2, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. We're given a new life, we're a new creation. So creation, full, promise, redemption, new creation. In a nutshell, that's the gospel. But there's many ways to describe it, but that's, that's one of them. Um, 
The gospel is all about Jesus. No matter how you chop it up, no matter how you describe it, no matter how, what journey you take to get to it, if it's not about Jesus, if it's not about what he did on the cross, then it's not really the gospel. If that's not your focus, if that's not the focus, does that make sense? It's all about Jesus. No matter how you get to the whole Bible, it's about Jesus. It's all working towards um, Jesus. It's nothing to be ashamed of. And Paul said to the Romans, for I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. The same power that God used to create the world, raise Jesus from the dead, is the same power he used to save each and every one of us. And the, God, the gospel is about God's grace. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me, Paul said. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given to me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Paul is here saying farewell to the, the Ephesian lead the elders on his way back to Jerusalem. He's saying his life is worth nothing. Just finishing what God has tasked him with. And I don't know what God has tasked you with. You might know yourself, you might not. And that, but to Paul, what God has tasked him with, he did a lot of other things with his life. It was with telling people the good news of God's grace, and that is through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Come on. So, big picture creation, fall, promise, redemption, and new creation. This is the gospel. It's all focused on Jesus. If it's not focused on Jesus, is it the gospel you need to ask yourselves? Are you talking about the good news? Just some stats here. Um, this was uh, an Evang Evangelical Alliance um, survey that was done probably quite some time ago now. Um, the, big, the headlines here is 54%, how do people come to faith? 54% growing up in a Christian family or church environment. 43% of people surveyed the influence of Christian friends who shared their faith. 37% um, making a decision in response to a specific church event, mission, or sermon. So loads of people come to faith on Sunday. I'm joking. 30% um, a youth club, camp, or similar activities. If you do youth work, keep doing it. If you do camps, keep investing in them. They are great. And 25% privately searching for God, reading the Bible. I don't know where I would fit into this with my little encounter on the website, but I'm in there somewhere, I guess. But do we see that the main headlines here are youth work, making a decision because of an outreach event, a mission that a church has done, somebody on mission doing something, and a sermon, influence of a Christian friends and growing up in a Christian household. I don't even need to unpack that anymore for you. I think we all get it. Um, what's important there and here's some more stats um, and this is what ages did people come or make the decision to give their life to Jesus and the big headlines is here look at that youth work is really important and I think we underestimate just how important it is sowing those seeds when people are young um, it sticks and whether they give their life to Christ or not um, if they heard it here doesn't, no, sorry, if they heard it here in primary school, for example, they are soaking it up like a sponge. Youth work is so important, and I could go on and on and on, so I'm very passionate about it. We're going to wake each other up now. So stand up if you became a Christian under the age of 25. Oh, the youth work was amazing. I have a youth work, oh, wow. Goodness me. Okay, I didn't expect that. Okay, uh, as you were. <laughs> Um, stand up if there was an exact date or time. You can remember the place, the time, the second. You know when you got saved. Ah, interesting. Okay, as you were. Stand up if you, and I'm already standing. Uh, Tony, can I come to, I don't know. Oh, I just know where I stand with this one. If you came to faith over time, so it was a gradual, interesting, as you were. And stand, oh, sorry, as you were, do take a seat. <laughs> um, I've got to work out how to do that a bit better. Sit down. Um, <laughs> put in the window down. Um, stand up if you made two, made more than two commitments growing up. So did you commit yourself to Christ? Did you backslide, whatever that means? And did you have to recommit yourself growing up? Okay, yes, yeah, sit down. Do we see, just already with that silly little exercise, one, how important you just... <laughs> 
um, I've done it in bigger churches with more people and, and less people stood up, although a good portion of the room did. But that would, I'm not very good at maths, but that was what, about 75% of you maybe stood up. You came to, to, to Christ under the age of 25. How many of you came to Christ, this isn't in the script, under the age of 16, if you don't mind me asking? Put your hands up if you don't want to stand up. Okay, cool. Yeah. So how many of you came to Christ? Sorry, I'm going to stop in a minute. Came to Christ um, at university. So maybe sort of 18 to 20, 25 in the latter. Okay, so a good portion of you came to Christ. That is, that is really encouraging. Um, but again, it just resonates, it just sort of reiterates my point, how important youth work is. Um, and how now as, as golden oldies as most of us are now, how important it is for us to be investing in the young people, in our church, in our community, in our lives, in our, in our streets, wherever, because we was them one day. Um, and a lot of us, not including myself, because I came to faith later on in life, had the luxury of a church that was investing in young people. How many people around us immediately don't. One minute, put the person next to you in twos. If you haven't got a twos, then try and do it in a phrase. I'll give you guys four minutes. Share the gospel. How did um, anybody like to feedback, anybody risky enough to feedback how they found that? Tom, how did you find that? Spark them off. <laughs> Trying to figure out how do I say something that gets to the gospel from what you just said and all mm. that kind of thing. So mm. um, that that's that's hard. But um, so so it, it, it's I think to do the one minute exercise is just slightly hard because it's it's almost doing it sort of in the abstract when we know yeah. in, in real life we often oh we wouldn't really yeah yeah. Like yeah. Yeah, um, I but I think you know we we had a go at it. Here. Brilliant. I don't know how I was doing. Yeah. Any, anyone else? Ah, oh, gonna be the, the Roman mic guy. And and if there's anybody at home that wants to share um, how they found that, just stick something in the chat. Um, yeah. Uh, hi, it's so interesting to think about all the different things you could say. We sort of struggled to know where to start or mm. what to include and what not to include. So. Mm. Uh, I myself focus more on God promising to fix the world than Jesus taking our sin and then good, just good, good adding that promise to renew that world in yeah. the future. Whereas Laura talked a bit more what it means to accept that forgiveness for ourselves. Mm. We need to put our trust in Christ. And, and it's just interesting to pick up on the differences mm. in that. Mm. Mm. And, and, and from my experience, and, and I wish we had other sessions to, to unpack this in, but one of the sessions that I've done before is unpacking what's the inroad with somebody of the gospel? What aspect of the gospel does that particular person, that particular person's heart break? And it's always something in our heart that take, you know, um, blocked us away from God, that is blocking us away from God. Do they need to hear about God the Father? He's a disloving Father um, and, and, and that aspect of him. Um, I could go on and on, but yeah, so that's a really good point, a really, really, really important point you've picked on, and if I'd have known you was going to say that, I've got this lovely diagram um, on another PowerPoint, and it shows different ways that you can, um, so I might send that to you, Tom, you can maybe send it around, it might be helpful. Um, let's move on, because time is moving on. <laughs> um, wait for the mouse focus, I think the mouse focus needs to get back on the... I think if you just bring um, PowerPoint back, that's it, brilliant. So, so one of the things I would say is um, simplify your, 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 I don't know how you, you found that, but simplify your theology and, and your language. So for example, um, instead of saying to, to somebody, just for example, you really need to let Jesus come into your heart. That can really put a lot of people off, just for example, that phrase, because what does it mean for God who isn't sort of, physical tangible to come into your heart, which is beaten in you. So if you could say something else like, you really need to let God take control of your life. Um, 
So just, you know, avoiding jargon, you know, like sin, you're saved, redeemed. Um, I remember there's an organization called Enflame. I don't know if anybody's heard of Enflame. Um, great, great, great youth organization. Anyway, when I first became a Christian, I got thrown into youth work at St. Anne's, um, literally thrown into the hall to do youth work. Didn't know what I was doing. And we used to fill up the minibus, drive them over to Barnet at the time it was, um, Christchurch Barnet, and we used to take them to Enflame celebrations. Anyway, I walked in one day and they was having this, there was, they, they was having this open time of prayer as they were starting. And there was this young guy, he must have been about 16 at the time. And he was on the floor, he was crying his eyes out and he was banging the floor. And I've looked at my, my mate, Obi, the, the other youth worker. And I'm like, Obi, what's wrong with him? Like, should we go over and ask him if, what, what's wrong? He said, no, don't worry, Adam, they're, 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 they're charismatic here. And that's what they do. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know what it meant. I mean, I'm, I've been on the job for about a year as a Christian and he's saying to me, they're charismatic. So it's okay for him to bang the floor and be crying. That's actually a good thing. The spirit's working on them. Jargon can really confuse people um, and put them off. Um, and be aware of somebody's family context and in terms of their culture, in terms of um, where they're from, in terms of their religious backgrounds, if they've got some, if they haven't got any, um, what is their home makeup? Are they married or they're not married? What's the relationship like at home? Do you know it? There, there's so many things that, as you said, you wouldn't know where to start with the gospel. It's really good to get to know somebody before you just hit them with the gospel. Unless the Lord is leading you to get in there with the end is nigh, um, it doesn't work most of the time. Um, and people do look at you like you're a bit, the end is nigh-ish. <laughs> um, <laughs> goodness me, do you all know that person who's the end is nigh-ish? <laughs> um, and build up to gospel challenges at key times, as in build up to these things. If you know somebody's going through something, you don't necessarily have to share the gospel with them in that moment. You can build up to it. So if you're if you're meeting up with somebody and, and going for coffee or for a drink or whatever to get to know them and to, and to minister them and come alongside them because they're going through this particular problem and you really want to share the gospel with them, you really want them to come to faith in Jesus, but you don't have to hit them with it straight away. You can do it over a period of time, sort of patiently and sensitively and, and maybe invite them along to, to an alpha or to something that's happening at, at church. But building trust takes time and it takes building respect and, 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 and all the things that you normally have to build in relationship. But when you've got the intention of sharing the gospel with this person and wanting to see that person come to faith in Jesus, um, you've, you've got to take time and build trust with that, with that person to do it. Okay, in pairs, looking at the clock, um, gospel jargon test. So, it, it, we're going to uh, mm, mm, give you three minutes, try and explain each, explain each word in one sentence to each other and see how many you can get through until my loud voice comes through the speakers. And you're all going to be good students this time and stop straight away when you hear my voice, aren't you? No, you're not. Okay, off you go. <laughs> okay, I'm not sure if that was three minutes, but we're going to crack on. Um, Take a picture, watch the video back, practice it on your friends at work um, or not. Um, got some great ones in the chat. I'm going to read some of them out. Um, St. John's Downshire Hill said, <laughs> so I'm assuming that's you guys up there. <laughs> uh, sin, doing our own thing rather than God's thing. Um, Abby has said repentance, turning away from our sin back to God. Um, we've got Fiona Kennedy, great one, sin, shove off God, I'm in charge, no to your rules, what we teach in Sunday school. <laughs> um, we've got another one from Fiona, redeemed, bought back at a huge cost, something that is already belonging to God, so God has bought us back, that's a great one to use, I'm going to note that. Um, coming from the gallery, salvation rescued from the punishment for our sin. So, I'm going to whiz through these. Ooh. Once I've got my focus back, please, Gallery. That's all right. Ooh, there we go. I think it's back now. Did that move? There we go. There we go. Uh, so salvation. Um, and a way of putting it is rescued from the penalty for doing the wrong thing. 
um, justification, making me right with God as if I'd done nothing wrong. Um, there's that. There's a saying that we're, we're saved three times in our spiritual life. We're saved at the point we give our life to Jesus. God is constantly save, saving us, and that is justification. Um, and then we are saved again at the point of at, at when Jesus comes back in that cloud. Um, redeemed. God, ooh. You know, when you're putting a document together and you say, oh, I'm going to come back to that and edit it, ignore what it says under redeemed. What I basically meant to say was God's, God pays the price to bring us out of our slavery to sin or something like that. We'll edit the video. Reconciled, our re friendship to Jesus has been restored. Our, our, that bridge has been repaired back to God. Another way of saying repentance, a change of mind that leads to a change in actions. Read Acts 26, 20. Um, holy, set apart as one who has been worshipped. We could go on and on and on. In pairs. Um, let's, um, let's do this. We've got enough time, I think. So... In, this has to be in pairs. If you could stick them in, um, bake, get ready to stick them in breakout rooms. So num, pair, uh, pair member number one, you've got 90 seconds to share the gospel with number two, who has the, this is no insult, at, pretend you have the mind of a five-year-old. Um, number two starts with 10 points. <clears throat> Deduct one point for every jargon word used. Um, are you with me so far? Good. Um, and then you deduct a second point if the jargon word is not explained. Um, number one, it voids any loss if they explain the jargon word before they use it. So, for example, if they said, I know this is going to be really tricky. If they said, um, da, 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 they use the word salvation. If they said you've been rescued from the penalty for doing the wrong thing, that's salvation. They don't lose a point because they've explained. Do we get it? So number one, number two. Um, anyway, off you go. Give it a try. It's probably going to go horribly wrong, but off you go. Right. I will wrap this up by leaving you with the Romans Road to... Who's heard of the Romans Road to Salvation? Ah, somebody has. Okay. So if you want to take somebody down... Um, what if you want to take somebody down? Wow. Let me take that back. Let me not hang on that. Goodness me. I am so tired. If you want to take somebody on a journey through the Bible of what salvation means, uh, oops, um, this is an easy way to do it. And these are quick little verses that you can memorize. Um, so Paul outlines in Romans what the gospel is. So Romans 3.23, we're all sinners. We've all fallen short of God's glory, Romans 5, 8. I'm going to whiz through them really quickly. God loves you enough to die for you. Romans 6, 23, we deserve to die, but God's gift is eternal life. Uh, Romans 8, 1, there's no condemnation for those who are in Jesus. Romans 8, 39, nothing can separate us from the love of God. And Romans 10, 9 and 10, if you call on Jesus to take control of your life, you will be saved. And my point here is, get to know, Romans is a great book of the Bible. If I could take any book of the Bible, that's my desert island Bible book is Romans. Um, but get to know these verses and they're easy ones to just pick out the hat and share with people if you, if you want to share the gospel. Um, justification is not what I explained it to be. Um, it is actually, um, sanctification was the word I was looking for. But do memorize these verses. I hope that wasn't too fast and too furious. I hate those films, by the way. Um, and I hope that made sense. Um, if I could just leave you with this, please pray for us at London City Mission. So if you're thinking, how can I get involved? There's a few ways you can get involved. One is by praying for us and our work. And if you want to receive my prayer letter, let Tom, I'll leave my email address with Tom. You can email me and I can send you my quarterly prayer letter. It's a very easy email address. It's adam at lcm.org.uk. Um, if you feel called to give, and there's information on our website about how you can give to our work. And if you want to stay in touch, again, on our website, lcm.org.uk, we've got a quarterly um, prayer magazine and a quarterly mission magazine about what we're doing in London. Thank you very much. You've been a good audience. Being very polite, Adam. Thank you very much, Adam, uh, for that. That's uh, really uh, helpful and a great um, introduction to what we're going to be doing for, the, for all of this term. So I guess um, if, if you felt that was 
packing quite a lot in, which is wonderful we managed to do. The great thing is we're going to come back to lots of these things over the next eight weeks. So this has been a really good way into all the things we're going to be talking about in our small groups over the next eight weeks, digging into some of those questions a little bit uh, more detail, lots of chance to discuss these things further. So that's going to work really well to tie in. Um, and um, so thank you so much for, for kicking us off in, in, in that way and for your ministry on, on Sunday as well. Why don't, why, why don't I lead us in prayer now, and particularly pray for, for, for our London City Mission and their partnership with churches like us and other churches in London, as, they, as they've asked for. Father, thank you so much for the encouragement of this evening, and um, thank you that we've been able to um, think about how to share our faith and share the good news about Jesus with the world around us. And uh, we know this is challenging. It's hard. We all find this hard. And uh, we thank you for just being able to start to see what that means and ways in which we might be able to do that better with our friends and neighbours and colleagues and, uh, and families and indeed with others that we don't even know yet. And we pray especially for... Uh, Adam, we pray for London City Mission as they partner with churches in reaching the many in London who do not know about Jesus, who have not heard about him. And we pray for them especially as they, as they seek to reach the unreached, those who don't have Christian friends and colleagues and families and neighbours, who, 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 for whom, it, humanly speaking, it looks very difficult for them to hear about Jesus. We thank you that London City Mission is concerned to um, in, in, encourage Christians generally to reach those groups and so we pray that, um, uh, that we be able to all think creatively about what that looks like to reach those who need to hear about Jesus in this city and beyond and uh, we pray that in Jesus name. Amen.